Well, hello. It is awesome to be back. Um, it was um, an unbelievable trip, I will say that. And um, for those of you that didn't know, I got to, to go on kind of the trip of a lifetime. My professor, who is Richard Pratt, led it. He's uh, in charge of Third Mill Ministries. He was on staff at RTS for about 20 years. And then he is a... Um, a PhD in Harvard, from Harvard, got a PhD in Old Testament from Harvard, smart as they come, awesome guy. He led a group of about 80 of us uh, the past two weeks where we flew into Rome, got into Rome, took a boat, um, it's the first cruise I've ever been on, I think I told you that, that was, that was interesting. Um, and then we, we went down to Crete, and we got off at Crete, Crete is where Paul basically left Titus and said, Titus, we want you to build the church here in Crete. Um, it's kind of the, the home base of, of Philistines. You know, if you've heard of the Philistine people, someone calls you a Cretan. If, I know it's not a good thing. Um, but it's where the Philistines are ultimately from. Then we went to north Israel, got out of the boat, went to the Sea of Galilee. Or actually, we went to Nazareth, saw the home of Mary, where the angel came down and said, you're going to be great with child. We went down through Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine, down to uh, the, um, the hill where Dr. Pratt read the Beatitudes, right where Jesus said them. It was unbelievable. And he fed the 5,000 and uh, then immediately made it, darted to the Sea of Galilee, took off my shoes, put my feet into the Sea of Galilee. And then we went to Capernaum um, where Jesus called four of his 12 disciples. Then we went down to where Jesus was baptized. Um, next day, we went into the desert right around the Dead Sea, went to Masada, if you've ever heard of that, Masada in Gedi. That's where David uh, found the oasis where he was running away from Saul. And then we went up to Qumran, which I'll talk about that in a second. And then um, the last day in Israel, we went to Jerusalem, where we went to the Garden of Gethsemane. We went to uh, Mount of Olives, Jericho Road, of course, then to the temple. And you'll see some pictures here. It was an amazing time. Got on the boat. Then we went to Athens. Uh, we went to Athens um, uh, for a day there where Paul walked kind of what Paul did. And then we went back up to um, uh, where, uh, Naples, Salerno, and that was kind of a fun day, Amalfi Coast. I've never been there before. And then we went to Pompeii, which is right there, and then back to Rome. And uh, it was a trip of a lifetime, right? And um, to walk where Jesus walked and to, uh, to be where Paul had been, and he, he uh, preached and started churches. Um, to me, it was a game changer for me. Um, uh, to talk about it for so long, but uh, from Tampa, Florida, and then to be over there, um, it, it, was, it was amazing. Um, I want us to look at Romans 5, but um, to start this morning, I'm going to use the trip as kind of illustrations and to kind of inform everything this morning. Um, but I want you to kind of picture this in your head as we, as we think about starting, um, as we even think about starting our church, you know, what do we have to say? Um, what is the only thing that we have to say here at West Town? You know, the only thing we have to talk about are the scriptures. That is our rule for life. That's our authority. And so what, 1946, 1945, there's a shepherd boy. And he's in the desert, right? And he loses one of his sheep, and he takes a rock, and he throws it, right? He throws it, and it's right around this area here. I'll show you this first map. This is where we went. This is the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea. So if you look at the top there, in Qumran... There's this shepherd boy who has this rock, and he throws it, and um, as he's kind of uh, he's throwing it, and he's looking for his sheep, he comes upon this. Let's go to the next slide. This is the cave. And all of a sudden, he realizes there's a cave there, and this young shepherd boy, actually, I don't know how he did it, but he got inside of there. And as he went in, he realized there's a cave here. He saw these clay pots, right? And inside these clay pots, he realized, oh my goodness, there are uh, manuscripts of the Bible, of the Old Testament. Um, which for um, the church uh, was a game changer. And the reason it was a game changer was because all the uppities in, in the Ivy League um, in, in academia were saying, you know what, the Bible has been changed. You can't trust the Bible. You can't trust the Bible because over time, you know what people do? They change it. They change stories. They change words. They change meaning. That's what happens. So you, you know, the people, you know, some of these Bible scholars up um, in the Ivy Leagues were, were, were criticizing, criticizing the Bible. The latest or the earliest manuscript that we had in the 40s and 50s was uh, 1000 AD, right? And so all of a sudden, we get these clay pots known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. They pull those out, and they look at them, and they're dated first century, right? 
Some of them, extra biblical writings, are even, you know, of like 5th century B.C. And so what they do is they say, okay, let's compare them. Boom. They took out the 1st century ones, Dead Sea Scrolls. They took out the 1000 A.D. ones, ones that they had. And they, you know, they're present day. You know what they found? They're all the same. Amen? Right? Amen. All the same. By God preserved his story perfectly right and so when we say that the bible is inerrant the bible is infallible when we do good historical research and we find you know first century texts that are exactly the same as a thousand a.d texts that are exactly the same as the text that we read now what can you have and what can i have confidence we need to have confidence or the bible won't mean anything if we're always skeptical about the bible why in the world would you open it and so this discovery gave the church, hey, a lot of confidence and uh, credibility. Okay, the Bible is a historically verifiable uh, book that has been passed down, but it's been kept. And so as you think, and, and as, as I was thinking about the story of Scripture and, and the, God's providence and uh, letting the church you know, find these, um, do you trust the story? <laughs> Do you trust that the Bible uh, is true, that it actually happened and has been verified? And this was a major discovery for, for the entire church as we come to the story um, of the Scriptures. Now, in prepping for this particular part of Romans 5, of course, there's plenty of Genesis manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scrolls in, the, in these Qumran caves. In fact, they found, over time, they found 11 Qumran caves with a, a number of different copies. Um, and so I want us to go to a map of, of, of uh, this is just you know ancient Near Eastern map of, um, the, yeah, of the, the biblical world. And so in Genesis 1 and 2, uh, Moses writes about the boundaries of the Garden of Eden, right? And I'm, I'm, going, I'm going somewhere with this. And the top where the blue line is, basically what it says is the, the, the kind of the northeastern boundary, top boundary of Eden is, you may think of it as a smaller garden, it's not, it's huge, was the Tigris and Euphrates River that come out of the Persian Gulf there. That was the kind of the northeast boundary. You read this in Genesis 2. And then um, Moses describes uh, the Gihon and the Pishon River, which flowed into the land called Cush and the land called Havilah. Well, we know that that is the northeastern part of uh, Egypt. And he is saying, here are the boundaries of Eden. The Tigris and the Euphrates and the land of Havilah and the land of Cush where the Gihon and the Pishon River were. So ultimately, what does that tell you and what does that tell me? Well, when you think of Eden, you know what you need to think of? Israel. When you think of Eden, you think of Canaan. Eden was Israel. Eden was Canaan. And it was perfect, right? And here's the tragedy. Here's the, here's the tragedy. That Adam and Eve sinned and then this is what happened. And I'm going, I promise you, I'm going somewhere with this. Genesis 3.23. So the Lord, after they sinned, here's what God did. So the Lord banished them from the Garden of Eden. We're not exactly sure where. And he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden. And he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So where were they? They were banished out of the east. Right? So they're pushed out of the east. I want you to think about that. I want you to kind of keep that there in your noodle. Hold on to that. Okay. Adam was pushed out of the east. Okay. And the rest from, from, this, from this verse on, the story is, okay, how is God going to um, reestablish Eden? How is he going to do it? Because paradise was lost. You've got to re reestablish paradise. How are you going to do that? What is that ultimately going to look like? So this brings us to Romans 5, okay? In talking about Adam here again. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin, and I want to tell you, this is from the New Living Translation. I normally read from the, new, the NIV, but this is actually the New Living Translation. So when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone. So because of Adam, sin came in, death spread to every for everyone now sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. But it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. In other words, 
Between Adam and Moses, there was no Ten Commandments. And so these people didn't know what the law was. But, verse 14, Still, everyone died. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. So basically what Paul is saying here is, look, the effects of sin are terrible. And I, I think of it in terms of even like a child and an adult. An adult knows what's right, a child doesn't. But the curse of the fall still applies to the child. Death still comes. Now, they may not explicitly disobey a command, but death is, uh, they still feel the effects of sin. It's, it's on them because of what Adam did. Now, here is where Paul makes this contrast. But, there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, I want you to picture this. I have a picture of this, so picture this. <laughs> so this is the first place we got out in Jerusalem, right? So we got out, and what is that? That is the East Gate. What's the significance of that? Well, here comes Jesus. What is Jesus known as? The second Adam. Here comes the second Adam, right? We get a second chance through Christ being the second Adam. And what is he going to do? He's going to say this. Just as he, uh, Adam and Eve were banished out of the east, what, I'm, what am I going to do? I'm going to come back in to through the east gate, and I'm going to do what? I'm going to reverse. I'm going to renew all that was lost. I'm going to come in, and I'm the only one who can because I've never sinned, and I have the right to do that. Though he, was, he felt the, the temptations, he, he, was, he was perfect. It's not a sin to be tempted, but he was tempted in every way, yet he did not sin. So he comes in. You imagine a Jew. You know Adam would have been, you'd have memorized the first five books of the Bible. So you know Adam would have been banished out of the east. And here comes this guy who's known as the second Adam in through the east. Like, What? What, what, is, what is going on here? What is Jesus doing? Why is all of a sudden Jesus coming into to the east? He's coming to say, I am the second Adam, and you get a second chance, and I'm the Adam who didn't eat of the fruit. I'm the Adam who did everything. When, when Satan took me out to the Judean wilderness, just like the snake tempted Adam, yeah, the snake in the form of Satan tempted me in the wilderness for 40 days, and you know what? I didn't sin. So I can walk back in here. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to reverse everything that um, sin and death has done. I am, going, I am going to do that. Imagine that. Now, at the same time, he is not God or Jesus is not Spock, right? He's not just this robot. We know that because he is a human. And so literally right behind, there's the road looking at there. Literally 50 feet behind this is this. Let's go to the next slide. Is the Garden of Gethsemane. I didn't realize they were so close. They are. But imagine this. Jesus has walked in there. He's kind of proclaimed that I am the king. I am going to cleanse the temple. Then, before he knows he's going to die, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and what does he pray? Father, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm keeping this real. I don't want to do this. I do not want to do this. But you know what? I don't want to be away from you, Father, but your will be done. And he knew he was supposed to drink of this cup. And he, um, in his uh, humanity, in his sadness, he still what? He still obeyed, right? The allure of not experiencing pain was not enough for Jesus. And you sit there and you realize what he was about to do. And Rome was going to make fun of him, and the Jews were going to call him a heretic. And, you know, you sit there in the garden and you, and you think to yourself... He still went in the east gate for me. He still did it for me. Why would he do it for me? He knew what was coming, and he did it. And he is in the garden, and he looks around, and his buddies are falling asleep at his darkest hour. They're sleeping on him because they can't realize it. And I think to myself, this is me. I sometimes just don't realize what he has done for me. And then what did he do? And here's a map of New t uh, of Jerusalem, and if you look over there to the right, there's Gethsemane, and then you 
as he came in to the temple. And, um, and then you'll see, this is kind of a guess about where Golgotha was. And you, you notice, look at the scale there of 2,000 feet. Notice how close everything is. I didn't realize that either. Golgotha, even Golgotha to the tomb. That's essentially where they think everything was. But he went through this. He went back into what? He went back into Eden. You know, this, this cursed place. And he says, I've got to reverse the effects of what Adam and Eve did. So I am going to do that. And if you contrast what? If you contrast the sin of Adam, Paul is saying, and the grace and the gift of forgiveness, it's no contest. It's so much gr- The gift of grace is so much greater than what? Than the consequence of of the first Adam. Do you believe this? Do you believe that that is, that, you know, this man who walked in is truly what? Is truly the Son of God? Because here was the confounding part. Once we did all that, and we we were at the Mount of Olives right there by the Garden of Gethsemane, and we realized the Jericho Road that he came down, then we went into um, Jerusalem. And there is my buddy Steve (laughs) with his yarmulke on. I love it. And he's at the Wailing Wall. What's the Wailing Wall? That's the closest you can get to where the Holy of Holies was, where the temple was and the Holy of Holies was. What do we know happened in 600 is during um, the Islam kind of ultimately uh, took over this area and that's where they built the the Dome on the Rock there, Church of the Dome on the Rock, uh, the mosque. Um, But for a Jew, uh, this is the most holy place, right? And so all of us went to the Wailing Wall and if you notice... In, in the cracks of those stones there, people just write little prayers, and they put them in there. There's, there's thousands of them. You just look in all the different crevices. I mean, it's just filled with prayers. And you know what they're doing? They're praying to what? They're praying to Jehovah, to Yahweh. And you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to scream, right? I wanted to scream and say, you're waiting for Jesus to come. I want to say, he has come, Right? Here's where the Jews, they come and they pray because this is where the Shekinah glory was. And what Jesus did is he came into this place and he said, yeah, I am the temple and I actually will rebuild the temple in three days. But the Jews, they don't believe that. At least not the Messianic, the non-Messianic Jews. They don't believe that. And they are still waiting. They're waiting for the Messiah to come. And you would see them and, and many of the priests there's actually an area to the left there. You can actually get a little bit closer. Of course, you know, it splits very, very, you know, traditional and orthodox. So the, all the women are over on the right side and all the men are here all on the left side. And then you could go into another area. And I probably shouldn't have taken a, a little bit of video, but I did. I kind of snuck it and just wanted to, you know. But I don't know if that's good or not. Probably not good at all, but whatever. <laughs> um, but then you see these guys, right? And they had their prayer shawls on, right? And their prayer shawls, and they had four knots in each of the tassels, right? which is Y-H-W-H, which are the consonants, because in Hebrew you don't have verbs, and that meant Yahweh, the, the four consonants. For the, and they would hold on to it, right? And they would start rocking back and forth, and in their Hebrew way they would start chanting these psalms, and they would try to get themselves um, excited, and, and please God, I want you to hear my prayer. And I want to say, he's, he has come, right? He has come because... In, you know, in this very volatile place right here, where you could feel the volatility, you had Christians who believed that Jesus had come, you had Jews who believed, who were waiting for him to come, and then you had uh, the Muslims right there that believe a completely different story with a completely different book. And, you, you know, it's, it's at these moments you realize, man, this is it. This is like the story of the world. Which story do you believe? Which story of redemption do you believe? Because the Jews still believe he's coming. They don't believe in the 29, 27 books of the New Testament, but they do believe in the 39 books of the Old. They just don't believe in the New. And, you know, the, the Muslim believes in something different. And we Christians, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he came. And ultimately, he, you know, he walked, right? He, he came into the city and then he did what? Let's go to our next slide. This is the Via Dolorosa. This is the road that Jesus walked, the way of suffering, right? With his cross. And that's station number five. So there's, of course, 14 stations of the cross. And, um, you, you know, you're thinking and you're trying, I'm, I was just trying to put myself where he would be and, um, w- you know, where he had to go. And here's what was interesting is you're kind of in this Jewish part. Um, 
And then all of a sudden, as you walk the Stations of the Cross, you then move into the Islamic or the Muslim Palestinian part. Literally, you just walk into a different area owned by them. And you just had a bunch of shops, right, on the Via Dolorosa. And I, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking it's a bigger road. It wasn't. It was very narrow for most of it. That's a little bit more open. But, you know, you could maybe fit three people, right? And then you just had a bunch of shops, right? Just people. And you, I could hear, I could hear a few times I heard people say, yell at our group, which was a pretty large group, you know. Um, uh, yeah, we love you Christians. Or we love your money, right? I thought, yeah, all right, I get it. And as we're walking and I'm kind of like, oh, you know, you, you just, you think, what was, what was going on with Jesus? He was getting beaten and oppressed by Rome and those soldiers and those, you know, kind of the Jewish priests. They're calling him a heretic, and the Romans were, were beating him. They weren't exactly sure, but they, they don't want any revolutionary that's going to do anything to the empire. And I'm thinking, you know what the only thing that's, the, the thing that's changed is, it's not a Roman soldier now that's hitting, you know, that, that's oppressing us. It's, 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 it's like commercialism. It's what you could feel, you know? It's like everybody thought that they could make a buck here, right? Let's put up a shop here, and we can make a buck off religion, and it almost felt like it was weird because I was so, you know, you, you try to think about Jesus and being there and you just felt people wanting you to buy stuff and just trinkets and stuff everywhere. And you're just like, what is happening? And I almost thought, you know what? This is the pull I feel here. I feel everywhere. It's not Rome anymore, it's, but, it's, but it's commercialism or it's prosperity or it's living a certain way and making money. You know, and as you're walking, Jesus said, no, 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 it's worth it right i'll take whatever right and you just picture him getting beaten and walking his own cross and then simon doing it for him and then you're just like uh man how much does this guy love me like how much can this guy love me to do this for me because once i once i put jesus out there you know i was like okay with it but once i thought no no, he walked this thing for me that he walked this road and had palm trees thrown in front of him knowing that they're going to be turncoats and it was okay with him because he loved me and he loved you if you know him. I think when you begin to think about that, things change. I mean, it changed for me being there. So, So like, Jesus was all in. All in for you. Every, he, he was willing to go to whatever length it took, even to his death for you. He was completely in. And I'm wondering, you know, what does that do to you? Do you realize how much he loves you and how much uh, suffering and oppression that he took on to only to reverse it so that you could have this gift? So Paul writes this in verse 16. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of of that one man's sin or Adam's sin, right? For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. So in him, we are made right, right? If we believe in what he did, we literally walk the Via Dolorosa with him. We enter into the sufferings with him on the cross, and what do we do? We die with him and we resurrect with him when we are united to him and we believe that. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. You will. Now here's what we, here's what we also know, is that Paul, in two chapters, is going to let us know You will have victory, but you will also fail. You have power of victory through the Spirit, but you know what? The the kingdom hasn't fully come. And that's one of the misunderstandings that I think a lot of Christians, early Christians had, is when Jesus said the kingdom was coming, they thought it was coming fully. And then when it didn't come fully, and they still saw Roman power, they were like, is he selling us a bill of goods? This doesn't seem right. No. What Jesus was saying is, I've come to inaugurate this kingdom. I have come to give you the Spirit, and you have access to that, and the power over victory. But do you have total victory? No, you don't. And that was confusing, right? It was confusing for Jews, it was confusing for Christians, and so they didn't quite understand what that meant. And what Paul is saying is that ultimately, 
you will live in triumph over sin. And yes, do you have access to power over your addiction to alcohol right now? Yes, you do. Do you have uh, power over uh, your anger right now? You do. But are you going to have victory all the time? No. Paul says, I am a split man. I do things I shouldn't, and I don't do things I should. But Paul realized that the ultimate victory was his once he was changed. And so he's writing this letter, and he's so excited about, about what he's trying to tell uh, uh, Rome and what he's trying to tell Rome here, but also all of Asia Minor. Now imagine this. Imagine you're Paul, right? And you look at this picture. Let's go. That's the Parthenon, right? So then we floated to Athens. Imagine you have Paul who's converted Paul, and he starts to go on these missionary journeys, and he comes to Athens. Why is this important? Socrates, Plato, they were right here. They, I mean, they were forming the ideal world, uh, the ideas of the world. It was all being done really right here. And so there's the Parthenon. What's the Parthenon? That is a temple to Athena. That's all that is. The Parthenon is a temple to the goddess Athena. And what do you do to Athena? You bring her sacrifices. That's what you do. Because you pray that the, pan- the Greek pantheon of gods would bless you. That's, that's the whole goal. That's the Greek world, right? And so what do you do if, uh, if you're a good Greek? You build temples to these gods, hoping that they will bless you. Makes perfect sense, right? And so, here's Paul. And what does Paul decide to do? Let's go to the next picture. That's a picture of the Pantheon. Now, these white rocks right here, this is a hill, and it's called Mars Hill, or the Areopagus. And this is where Paul gave his famous sermon in Acts, uh, in Acts chapter 17, where he's there on Mars Hill where all the great philosophers of the day, this is Harvard Yard, right, where the brightest minds come together in the, the, the sight line of the Parthenon, Right? And the Parthenon has a bunch of other temples to other gods there. Imagine you're the Apostle Paul. And you're about ready to just try to eviscerate their whole um, idea of what reality is. And their whole idea of who really reigns. That's what you're doing. You're going to say all these Greek gods are untrue and they're false. And that's what he does. And Dr. Perry, who's the other uh, professor there, reads the sermon of Paul. Saying... Here's the one true God. And imagine, you're, you're, you know, you hear about this Apostle Paul and you want to come hear his sermon. And he's doing it in the sight line of the Parthenon, right? And then let's go to one other picture. Yeah, that's my buddy Steve. Hey, Steve, miss you, man. So Steve's got his little, um, little earpiece in for our, all our different um, tour guides. But the reason I show you this picture is that 17 years ago we went on a uh, mission trip and both of us had hair. And here we are, 17 years later, 16 years later, without hair. There we go. Um, that is another temple. That's literally, so, this, you know, if we're facing the Parthenon, that, that the, both of us, we could see the Parthenon. If you turn around, you see this other temple. And then if you go a little way over here, there's another temple. And actually, there's another one right here. 360 degrees, temples to Greek gods. And here's Paul. And he says, you know what? When I realize Jesus died for me, you know what I do? I go to the marketplace, I go to the academy, and you know what? If they kill me, they kill me. I don't care. Because for Paul, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why wouldn't they stone him? Why wouldn't they stone him on Mars Hill? They stoned Stephen. Why wouldn't they do it? He didn't care. We know if you read the book of Acts, God preserved him. God guarded him because he had this, what did he want to do? I mean, what was, what was Paul's desire the whole time? Get me to Rome. Get me to Rome. I don't care. John Mark, Barnabas, whoever wants to come with me, I don't really care. Because he's, he's getting there. He's in Asia, we're in Athens, right? And we just got to jump over one more sea, right? We got to go up the boot because we're going to get to Rome. Why? Because that's the hub. That's where Caesar is. And what does he want to do? I want to share the gospel with Caesar. He thinks he's in charge of the whole thing. The whole push of the book of Acts is is Paul wants to get to Rome. I want to get there. That is what matters. And as I thought, maybe you might be thinking, okay, what does it mean? I love what Paul shows us to be in the world, right? He doesn't leave. He doesn't go out to Qumran Caves and build a, build a, a, 
a, you know, a monastery and live there. He doesn't do that. What does he do? He goes to the marketplace. He lives in a cosmopolitan city of Athens, right? And he says, I am not going to be a sellout. I'm going to be in but not of the world. Are you that? Are you really in the world but not of the world? Some of us are not of the world, but when we're honest, we don't know any non-Christians. We don't, have, we don't have key conversations with the world. We're not in the world. And then there's some of us that are in the world. We have a ton of that world, worldly friends, but we're not um, in the world, but, not, but we're not, <laughs> but we're, uh, we're, we don't look any different. And here's Paul, and he's saying, no, I'm going to go to the place. I'm going to go to the New York City. And I'm going to stand there. I'm going to go to Harvard Yard. I'm going to go, and I'm going to you know, have my, my key city be Tampa. And within the different industries of Tampa, I'm going to be the best lawyer, doctor, businessman, um, businesswoman. I'm going to be the best mom or dad. I'm going to be the best coach. I'm going to be fully present. And you know what? I'm going to be in the world, but I won't be of the world. And I will, I will share Christ, but I will be different from Tampa. I won't be Tampa, but I'll be Christ in Tampa. And that's what Paul did. And when I saw that, I'm like, man, are we doing that here? Are you doing that? Which ways are you in the world, but not of the world? Some of us need to get in, and some of us need actually to get out. And Paul, I think, was a beautiful, not perfect, but beautiful picture of what that was to be. Is that you? Is that our church? Last two verses. Yes. Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. Obviously, that's Adam. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteousness or righteous. Our world has to hear this. Your neighbor needs to hear this. Students, your buddies need to hear this. When you go to work tomorrow, people need to know that, yes, you're a part of the Adam. You, you feel the effects of Adam because you are part of the disobedience. But you know what? There is the second Adam that came, and he did it all right. And he came into the city. He came to Zion, right? Do you know the Temple Mount is literally the, the mount where Abraham brought his son Isaac? I don't know if you knew that. That's Mount Moriah. The, the, the Temple Mount is Mount Moriah, where Abraham brought his son Isaac, where God brought his son Jesus. It's the exact same spot. And he said, this is the way we're going to do it, right? We're, we're, we're going to reverse things through sacrifice and love. That's the means by which the world will change. And if we do that, I mean, it's Thanksgiving. You're going to be with family. For some of you, that's awesome. Others of you, not so much. Right? What does love and sacrifice mean? What does it mean to be Jesus? To be in the world and not of the world. To be honest about where you are, but fight for obedience. To fight for love. You know, when you see what Jesus did and you walk his footsteps and you realize all that he went through. And then you realize here's a guy who wasn't Jesus, but he was radically saved. And he said, whatever, um, I'm going to live, right? I'm going to live like today is my last day. And that's the way Paul lived. I mean, so we cruised the Mediterranean Sea from Rome to Jerusalem. That's a long way. For a dude to get on a boat without a radar and without a motor and a sail. I mean, I mean, the wind is horrible. I mean, it is really, I mean, it is windy, right, on the Mediterranean. I mean, I don't know. I just didn't have categories for this. So I'd never been, you know. And just to think, he did that, and he just went all these different cities, and he just said, you know what, I'm going all the way, and we know what happened, right? We know, uh, it doesn't tell us in the scriptures, but we know through Josephus and a couple of Eusebius and other historians there uh, during that time, is that Paul was martyred. That Paul and Peter were martyred. So we get back to Rome, right? Get off the boat. The next day we're flying out. The last thing we did, Dr. Richard and Steve and I, we're walking up the steps of the Colosseum, right, in Rome. And we get up to that, you know, first terrace, and you look out, and it doesn't have like a, a, a floor where they would actually do the fighting because I guess it's just not there anymore. You just see where they put the tigers, 
and the lions. They put them underneath. And then when it was time, and this is what we found out. So at lunchtime, they would have like a, um, a battle between a Christian and a lion. And you got off on your lunch break, and the Romans would get off on their lunch break, go to the Colosseum, watch a lion eat a Christian, pull them apart. And then, okay, I had my 45-minute show, and then they would go back to work. Every day, this is what happened. This is what Christians did. This is the way in which they were persecuted. And so when Jesus says, you know, blessed are those that are persecuted, he says that up on the, you know, the mount there, about sea, uh, sea of Galilee. Um, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those that mourn. He is saying, look, give everything you have. And being there, thinking about Paul and thinking about Jesus, I want to bring that back to you. And I want to say, man, it is a game changer. And I hope we can get groups to go from this church. I actually do. Uh, that I think, it, I think it's just, it's different. Just doing it, walking it. Um, and then responding to what Paul is saying. Because if the condemnation does not compare to the glory that you're made for, right? If it's so much greater, right? I mean, the world needs to hear this. And um, it can hear it sometimes by words, but mostly you preach a sermon through your actions, right? We know that. It's your life that preaches a sermon. It's not your words. And when you do that, and when you live like that, and you're like Paul, who wasn't married, right? He, wasn't, he didn't have kids. And he didn't ever talk about that. He wasn't missing out on anything. Paul didn't miss out because he was single and wasn't married or didn't have kids. He wasn't missing out. He says, I am free. And to me, that is the compelling thing, is that Jesus, even though it hurts sometimes, Paul, they're free men. They're free in Christ. They're free. Are you living that way? Am I living that way? I, I, want, that, I want this passage, I want this story, I want the, the truths of this land to compel us to, to live in him, in that grace, right? And then I guarantee you, we will be walking sermons. And people will say, how do you talk like that? How do you live like this? I'm nervous all the time, or I'm angry all the time, or I'm high for a couple seconds, and then I, then I need you know, a bunch of pills. And they say, what do, what do you have? Please tell people about this. Please tell people about this story, about this message. It's, it's a game changer. It's what Jesus did for you. It's, it's the message that Paul... Um, preached with his mouth and with his uh, with his life. Amen. Amen. Let's.